Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Mission Conservation live stream event. My name is Ryan, and I'm here at Wonders of Wildlife National Museum and Aquarium in Springfield, Missouri. We are happy to have you guys with us again as we wrap up the month of January and talking endangered species. And so before we get started, as we always do, let's take a second and find out how you can download and play the Mission Conservation Mission for this month. So you're going to want to go to our website at www.wondersofwildlife.org forward slash mission dash conservation. Once you're on our website, you'll see the mission conservation uh, box to the right that says get the app. You're going to click on that box and that's going to take you to a place where you can download the Agents of Discovery mission or Agents of Discovery app. It's a free app to download um, to your mobile device. And once you have the app installed, then you're gonna to wanna to open it and search for the mission for that month. Our featured mission is at home mission conservation, endangered species of the world. And so you're gonna to wanna to search in the search bar for that mission. The last thing you need to do before you can play the mission is to print the images that are used for triggers. Those trigger images pull up the challenges within the mission as you play the game. So you're gonna to want to find the blue box that says print images, click download. You can either open those and play from your desktop screen where you sit, or you can print those images, hide them around the room, take them outside, make a scavenger hunt of it, and have some fun learning about endangered species. Also, as a part of our monthly missions, we have an activity guide and a mission reward. And so once you have that mission pulled up on the website, you can see the link for the activity guide, which has a fun indoor and outdoor set of activities that are themed to the uh, mission for that month. We also have a mission reward. So once you've played the mission, you can unlock the mission reward and that link will show you uh, the reward for that month. So that's how you play. Again, this is our last week in January for our Endangered Species of the World mission. We'll be uh, showing you a brand new mission next week. So before we get to our partner for today, we are um, excited to uh, be featuring another conservation partner here in just a minute. But I want to talk for a second about what I have behind me. I am in the Amazon exhibit here at Wonders of Wildlife. And the reason I'm in the Amazon exhibit is because we're talking parrots today. We're talking endangered parrots. And the Amazon is home to 30 species of parrots, some of which are endangered. And so be sure to look out for the Amazon exhibit the next time you're visiting Wonders of Wildlife. But for today, we are going to travel all the way out to Puerto Rico. And so we are excited to have with us today, Jessica and Victor from El Junque National Forest in Puerto Rico. Jessica and Victor, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. And I'm happy to join you here in El Junque all the way in Puerto Rico. Hello, Thank everybody. You. I'm Victor. And pretty good, thank you, thank you. Pretty happy to be part of this live stream. Well, so what do you today, have? We're talking parrots, aren't we? We are talking parrots today. So let me go ahead and, and get our presentation ready for you. Um, go ahead and bring this up. And we're really happy that you guys are here to join us. We're going to share with you about the conservation history of the Puerto Rican parrot. So uh, without any more intro, here we are. So with the Puerto Rican parrot, um, here on the front page of the newspaper after hurricanes that were three years ago, the parrots are saying, ayuda me, you saying help me please. So we're gonna let you know about where we are in the world. So basically um, we are on the Caribbean because uh, we have a, a tropic climate. We got parts here on the island like and South America and Central America. Um, so that start, that's where we are, where, where the star shows. And we are on a Junca National Forest located 
uh, that's where we have uh, our aviary we're going to be talking about uh, thanks to the conservation program of our partners Fish and Wildlife Service. And our second population, uh, it's, uh, it's managed by DRNA, Departamento de Recursos Naturales or a State Natural uh, Resources Department. They manage another excellent population all the way on Rio Abajo in Arecibo, Utuado. So, Jessica. So the Puerto Rican parrot is the only native parrot left in Puerto Rico. All the other parrots, the Amazonian type of parrots, are all extinct. So this is our last native parrot, and we work very hard to make sure that it stays with us. Uh, its scientific name is Amazona vetata, or in Spanish, it's Cotora puertorriqueña. So we're going to learn a lot more about this parrot. It is a species that loves to eat fruit, nuts, and seeds. It basically, if it can open the nuts, if it can get through the skin, it can eat it. So it will eat uh, anything from mangoes. It will eat apples if they can find it, coffee. It will also eat this royal palm that you see in the picture, this tall tree with some seeds on it. It will eat the seeds from the royal palm. That's in the Elgin Gay National Forest. And in the picture on the right, you can see some of our partners at Fish and Wildlife Service, they are preparing breakfast for the parrots. And that particular day breakfast was dog food with some fruit loops mm -hmm. and cut up beans and uh, mixed vegetables. So they really do eat a wide variety of foods. Um, and it's really fun to see what they can find. So parrots are very social creatures. They love to talk. They have a really wide vocabulary. And in that vocabulary, they have different sounds that they use to communicate with each other. So we're going to listen to a little bit of video about that. All right, so that was the parrots talking to their friends, talking between each other about whatever they want to say. I don't speak parrots, so I can't really tell exactly what they're saying. Mm -hmm. um, but I do know that I have some special sounds for when there's an intruder. They have like a, a special call for that. And they have a special call that when they see a hawk, a predator around. So before we go into our history, I wanted to take the time to show you a taxidermy parrot that we have here with us today. Victor, you want to hear this? Yeah. So with us, this parrot is quite old. He's taxidermied, meaning that he died of natural causes, and we saved his body. We dried him out. We took out his insides, and we stuffed it with, with stuffing like your teddy bears. And we do that so that we can study and understand the parrot more, understand what are the parts of his body, understand his feathers, what food did he eat, what killed him, why did he die? Um, and then also we can share a parrot with you without harming the ones in the wild. So we have him here today. This is a young parrot. I can tell you he's a juvenile when he died. He never grew up to be a full adult. And He's in pretty sad condition. He is quite old. He's from the 1970s. Um, so, sorry, his feathers look a little tattered. <laughs> but that is often how they look around bol molting time of year when they grow and shed their old feathers and replace them with new ones. So, that's our friend here. And so, we'll go back to our presentation now. So, before the humans came, uh, before the humans came in to Puerto Rico and there was just the wildlife, there were millions of parrots. We believe there were more than six species of parrots um, and that parrots were common, just like uh, a sparrow or um, 
a blue jay in the States. It was commonly reported in the history that people would see flocks of thousands of parrots flying around. But in, in history, the people found Puerto Rico, Christopher Columbus found Puerto Rico as well as the United States, and people started settling it. Um, as people settled in the islands, they cut down trees to make their houses. They cut down trees to clear land for farming. And you can see in these old pictures, people were cutting a lot of trees to grow their food. Uh, that was the main reason that land was cleared. And uh, about the mid 1900s, over 95% of the island was cleared and there was no more original forest on it. So only 5% of forest was left. And most of that was in El Junque National Forest because this special place to us, El Junque National Forest is very steep. It's difficult to walk on because the mountains are so rugged and steep. And it made it hard for people to cut the trees down and grow food. And they said, oh, it's too much work. So they didn't do that. This means that by the 1960s, the only Puerto Rican parrots left were found in El Junque National Forest. There were no other parrots left on the island. Parrots also disappeared because people captured them to be pets. Uh, some people have pets in their house that are parrots and they might be ones that are really common or they might be really rare and then maybe more expensive. And so one of the ways that we lost the parrots in El Junque was that people would hike into the forest and capture baby parrots that were still in their nest and take them home. So, in 1960s, we realized, oh my goodness, there were not many parrots left in the wild. So on this graph, you can see that in 1968, the very first time there was a census or a formal count of parrots in the Aljunque National Forest, there were only about 25 parrots left. That's it, 25 parrots left in the wild. And that was a big concern to us biologists because that's not very many parrots, and we were really worried about them going extinct. So, as uh, in, in time went on, we, the Forest Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service started a recovery program. And you can see in this graph, there's three sets of lines and I'll walk you through each one. So the top one, that the total, the very top line, it is the total number of parrots, no matter where they live, okay? The next line down with the dots on it, that's the number of parrots in the wild. And then the bottom line, with the triangles, that is how many parrots were in the aviary. And in the very beginning, because there weren't many wild parrots, we were very careful about taking parrots and putting them in captivity to make to grow more parrots because we didn't want to take too many because we want them to be alive in the wild too. We also didn't know how to raise the parrots. It's very hard to do something brand new that you'd have never done before. And so we took in the beginning only two, three parrots at a time and tried to grow them but we weren't very good at it at first. You can see in this first few years, we really weren't growing more parrots. We actually were losing as many as we were growing. We learned to uh, bring over some Dominican Republic parrots that are similar and use them as foster parents to help raise our baby Puerto Rican parrots and help us learn how to raise the Puerto Rican parrots we practiced with the Dominican parrots. And as we got better at that, you can see in our bottom line the, that our number of parrots in captivity started growing. We started learning about uh, different ways to help the, the eggs that are laid grow into parrots healthfully so that we can raise them in captivity. And so over time we learned things such as replacing the, the real eggs with fake ones. And we, we the people take care of the real eggs and switch them back in right before they hatch. Uh, we learn to do things like control pests. Um, there's some flies that like to get into the nests and make it difficult for the baby chicks to survive, for example. And so we're figuring that out over the years. And you can see 1968, you go along. The number of parrots in the captivity in our aviary starts going up. By 1985, we start having more parrots in captivity than in the wild. So we're getting really good at growing the parrots. And ever since 1985, our number of parrots in, in the aviaries has just gone up and up and up. So we figured that part out. But much harder has been raising 
parrots in the wild and getting them to survive in the wild. And you can see this, the line with the circles that the population went down and its lowest number was 13 parrots in 1975. And that number has gone up and down and up and down and up and down. But we are slowly getting up by 1990s. Here's another look at just the wild parrots and going all the way to today. And you can see that our number of parrots went up for a while and there's some gaps or some years you don't have surveys. And then it's also gone back down and we've had some really big drops and we've had some great recoveries. One of those challenges has been hurricanes. So Hurricane Hugo in 1989 uh, dropped our population pretty substantially. We lost over 10 birds in one year in Hugo. Again, in Georgia's, we lost over half of our population. So over 50% of the parrots perished from Hurricane George's. And then Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Maria just recently here, three years ago, uh, really wiped us out. We had the highest number of parrots we'd had in a long time. We had about 36 parrots. And we got down to three in the within six months. And then we got down to only one in the wild. And we said, we can't lose the last wild bird. We just cannot. So we captured him, we put him back in the aviary. His name's Mario, if you'll learn about him more in a minute. Um, but for Mario, we said, no more, we can't have you alone in the wild, you're not safe. So we put him in captivity. And so for over a year, there were no wild birds, no wild parrots in Aljunke National Forest. Last year, in January, so January 2020, we, we finished our process we're going to share with you, and we were able to release 30 parrots back into the wild. And so you see that here in year 2020, we released 30 parrots. And now today, we have about 22 parrots in the wild. We're getting ready to release some more. So we talked a little bit about hurricanes. This is a an aerial imagery from our weather service of what Hurricane Maria looked like when it was coming across Puerto Rico. And I can say that, wow, the hurricane was bigger than the island. And so when the hurricane affects the whole island, where do we go? What do you do? Where do you hide from a hurricane? And for wildlife and for Puerto Rican parrots, we call that refugia. Where is a place to hide? So when the parrots, they hid in trees and they actually flew away. They, they tried to hide inside their cavities the best they could. Um, but it was pretty windy and rainy outside, so mm -hmm. they didn't all make it through that, but some of them did. So hurricanes are a natural part of Puerto Rico and all of the Caribbean islands, that they are our natural disturbance regime or, or the things that make changes and help rejuvenate our lands, help new plants to grow. And they're natural here. They're, they are, they have been around for a long time since we began recording history of hurricanes in 1899. And you can see on this graph the paths that different hurricanes have taken over the island. These yellow circles you see on here are the populations of the Puerto Rican parrot that existed before Hurricane Irma Maria three years ago. All right? But right before Hurricane Irma happened, we had just started releasing parrots in Maricao, and we were worried that they were not going to make it through a storm. They're brand new, so we took them out of the wild and we put them back in the captivity. So that's the X. We got we pulled them back out. After we lost our last Mario from the wild, we no longer had a population in the wild in Aljunquia National Forest, and that left our only wild population of Puerto Rican parrots in the whole wide world in Rio Bajo. And so as a biologist, we were very concerned that if we didn't do something, all it would take is one more hurricane that lines up with that yellow dot to wipe out all of our parrots in the wild forever. So we we're pretty concerned about that and we wanted to put parrots back in the wild again. Thankfully, we still have parrots in our aviaries in Rio Bajo and our aviary in El Junque National Forest. So we're talking a lot about hurricanes and what they can do. Here's a picture after Hurricane Hugo in 1989. And this was a rainforest, it still is a rainforest. This is our office building back in 1989 and what it looked like after the hurricane. 
After Hurricane Irma and Maria, about a, a month after, things started to green up. This is a view from along one of our roads in Ojungay National Forest. So you can see some of the things that happen after hurricane. And so we would encourage you to apply your great thinking skills and let us know why do you think parrots died from hurricane? We'll give you a second to put that into the chat box. Let us know what you think. And then we'll see if your answers match with our answers. So we found that the single biggest reason that parrots died after hurricanes was because they starved. They didn't have any food to eat. And this makes sense because we learned that parrots like to eat fruits and nuts and seeds. And after the hurricanes, you couldn't see much for fruits, nuts and seeds and trees. It was all blown away. So they had a hard time finding food. Predation. So parrots were also eaten by hawks, particularly the red-tailed hawk or, or the water whale. And those hawks had an easy time finding the parrots because we didn't have much for canopy. We didn't have leaves in these trees anymore because the hurricanes blew them away. We also lost about a third of our parrots due to the hurricane itself. The flying debris, the pieces of houses, and all that wind and rain physically crushed the parrots and we found their bodies sadly afterwards. And last, we did lose a few from heat. Uh, the parrot do you find shelter from the hot tropical sun and in, by hiding under the leaves of the trees and there weren't many leaves to hide under. So in this picture, there's a little bit of a search and find. You can see a, an artificial nest. This is an area where we have managed for the Puerto Rican parrot in the past and we install nests in these trees to provide them places to nest. So we'll yeah. talk a little bit about that in a minute. <laughs> yeah, imagine that, as you can go back, imagine that all that area was full of canopy, you weren't able to see the clouds. So that's how a hurricane affects a tropical rainforest. Thank you, Victor. So now we're going to talk about how we help bring back the parrot. And this is where it gets really fun. So um, this is where we turn it over to you, Victor. So on the aviary, uh, there's experts uh, and Spanish is avicultores. Um, just before I keep going, if somebody has a question on Spanish, feel free to do it. Uh, or there's somebody that wants, uh, we are, uh, I think we are live on Facebook right now. Somebody wants to make any question on Facebook on Spanish, feel free to do it. I can ask that questions too. Um, so continuing with the aviary, uh, we got on the Luquillo Mountains, the Iguaca aviary. That's the name of the, of the aviary. That's where uh, biologists and experts reproduce uh, parrots. Uh, actually, we have more on, on the Luquillo aviary, we got more than 400 parts uh, for multiple purposes to keep uh, reproducing the parrots or candidates for releasing. Let's play this video, you guys can hear how a parrot sounds. So this parrot is at our aviary in Ojinke National Forest. And you can see, just like a pet parrot, we provide them a lot of the same things mm -hmm. inside the aviary. But they're not pets. Okay. All right. So our, we, so we talked a bit about growing more parrots. That's one piece of helping bring back the parrots. Another piece was making sure that the parrots that are in the wild have what they need to survive and to thrive and reproduce and make more baby parrots. And so one of those ways is the artificial nest program. So if you remember back when I talked about how over 95% of the island was cut for all trees were cut down to make space for farms, to make space for 
all these people living on the island, that removed the big trees that parrots need. So parrots need a really big nest to live. And you can see in here some of the things we do to keep these nests active. We climb trees uh, and we take care of these nests. But let you, let's show you one of our nests that we have right here. So I'm gonna stop the presentation for a second. So with us, behind us, we have an artificial nest. Right here, see, there's one. And the parrot goes in the top. And this is the entrance to its nest. It comes in the top and it goes down and it expects in a really old tree, this would have been a, a hole caused by rocks and fungus, making a cavity or hole inside of a tree. And it keeps going down, 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 down which protects the parrot from predators who try to get its babies out of that hole. And it goes down into this bigger hole of where the parrot can, the baby parrots actually are in the nest. So it's a pretty big structure that we make. Um, we put this in the trees for them. When this is all assembled, it's about this tall. So it's taller than me even. We can't even see it all the way in the picture. Here we go, it's all the way up there. So these are big structures, but that's what it takes to grow a parrot. So it's tall now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then right next to us, we have a, a model of a real tree. It's a model, so it's not really real. And that's what our parrot's inside of right here. You could imagine that the baby parrots were inside the tree, but the way the mom got inside was actually a pipe much taller, and the hole was, was higher above in the tree. So that is an artificial nest for you. So let's go ahead and get back to our presentation. All right. Thank you, Victor. Welcome. So you can see in this uh, video here, in this picture, sorry, that we are wearing bee suits. So not only do parrots love these nests, but so do the bees. So we manage the bees in there, we remove them. We have to get to these places in the forest. We have to build trails to get to there. Um, this takes a lot of teamwork. We have volunteers that help us. We have experts. Victor with us is one of our technician experts in building all of this. Um, you can see uh, climbing trees. And we have a short video here where Victor is going to explain how, yep. how we do this. Um, they're good to see us there. I think the camera has to go. Um, yeah, on the right side of the video, we're gonna show you have a better example on, of how a artificial uh, nest looks after it's finished before we install it on the tree. You will see a video uh, with a nest already installed on the tree, and I'm I'm opening the tree during the during uh, the time that we are not in breeding season. We have to close it because. Uh, or animals, like Jessica was saying, like uh, this nest, like bees, rats, uh, snakes, etc. And to avoid dealing with them, we close them. But sometimes we got uh, some of, of these animals that get in some way. Uh, but yeah, let's, let's play the video. Okay, and before I play the video, we got a question of what the artificial nests are made out of. And you can see in this picture on the right that most of it's made out of PVC pipe. Mm -hmm. That we custom make this set up out of PVC. And this is a piece of a tree that we make a cap, we call it a goro. Mm -hmm. And inside the nest that you can't quite see, we place a me metal mesh that provides like steps for the parrot to climb in yeah. and out of the, the nest. And we cut into a door so that we can get into the bottom of the nest for we also checking them. Install cameras on it. That way, that way, if the if the nest is what well, like we call active, if it has uh, eggs or chicks, we can monitor them from the office with a camera. 
So we'll go ahead and watch your video, Victor, and, and you can see that Victor's in the tree. Well, well we are up here on the tree. Uh, I'm going to show you how do we verify the nest. This one was already um, checked, so it doesn't have any animals, including bees, etc. That can be dangerous for for the technician. So this one, I already put new nest. Well, we are up here on the tree. Uh, I'm gonna show you how do we verify the nest. This one was already um, checked, so it doesn't have any animals including bees, etc. that can be dangerous for for the technician. So this one, I already put new nest material. That's basically uh, mulch. So let me show you the inside. So that's the ladder where the parrots climb up and climb down to get access to the bottom of the nest. Like this, they start coming down here. They, this is the entrance. So they perch here. They got inside the nest ba -ba -ba -ba, to this PVC eight inches pipe. They climb to that elbow and the ladder it's right on the side of the of the PVC pipe they start going down all the way down this has like 32 34 inches tall the ladder on the end the bottom of the nose we got so that's how it looks I'm using my safety uh, equipment, including my uh, lanyard. This is called a lanyard system. It has a pussy a friction nut with this pulley. So I can show you on the next video more how, how this system works. So we were down there and we are up here. Around, I'm gonna stay my 25 30 feet above the ground. How you enjoy it? Thank you for that, Victor. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's not much internet in a tree, so we couldn't really bring you out there to share that with you. But, but I'm glad we have the video to share. So, here in our Next slide, we have a couple nests that are installed in the forest to give you an idea of how we hide them. We want them to look like they're part of nature so that the parrots aren't thinking of them as artificial nests, but they're thinking of them as just a nest in the forest. Mm -hmm. And so we try to disguise them and make them blend in as best we can. So if you can find them, there's one hiding out here on the right and there's another one hiding here on the left. They're, they're really good finding this nest. Maybe we are not that good if we are on the wild, but they're really good. Uh, it's like a natural instinct they have finding natural cavities uh, on the on the forest. Um, I was gonna mention that uh, hurricanes bring them natural cavities because the uh, so it's a part of their their adaptation about uh, uh, hurricanes to found new natural cavities. So they know how to survive in case of hurricane. The thing is that the population is so small that a hurricane can erase them completely. But hurricanes could be good for a bird. And make it good in making nothing. For them, to yeah, find. yeah, yes. and bad in that erases the food. If a hurricane, most hurricanes in the past, this last ones were very different. 
It does. The, right, yeah. the ones in the past affected part of the island, so the parrots could fly to the other areas that had food and go get food. Yeah. But the recent ones were. Yes. And we can talk later about a hurricane like this one with the gets so strong that they're not gonna survive. Yes. Uh, it's and that's a whole nother topic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are. Um we wanted to share a nice close up to see a little bit more about what we do. So on this bird you can see a telemetry uh, beacon attached to this parrot. And so parrots that are raised in captivity in the ABIs before we release them we fit them with this telemetry device and have a little bit of a battery in it that lasts about a year and a half or so, plus or minus. And uh, that way we can find the parrot in the wild. And that's why we know where they go, we know where they find food, we know where they put their nests, et cetera. And what's very interesting is each signal is slightly different, so we know which parrot is where. Now the parrots, when they release, released them in the wild, this picture on the right, and I circled the parrot, found them in the tree for you. That was the first parrot back in the wild after our release in January, 2020. So you can say we were very excited about that. Our process to release parrots was a very, uh, very thoughtful process. It took us almost two and a half years of planning between the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Forest Service, the Lincoln Zoo, the local Department of Natural Resources in Puerto Rico, we all had big roles to play to figure out where are we going to put parrots back? How are we going to do it? What do we need in the forest to make it safe for them to make sure there's enough food? So we did plant surveys, food surveys. We built new nests, we built new trails to get to those areas. And we did all of that in a place that's easier to give them food in the case of another big hurricane. So we, we put a lot of thought into that. And uh, our partners in the aviaries have spent a lot of time uh, growing more parrots and training them to release them in the wild. So it's taken a lot of, of different partners working together to make this possible. So here's a wonderful video. This was the first breeding season after our release. So this was in uh, spring of 2020. We were super excited to see our friend Mario back in the wild. Yep. So the history about this nest and Mario. Um, after Hurricane Maria, we got actually three survivors of the hurricanes. Uh, it was Mario and two females. Um, long story short, uh, we installed a new nest uh, for the next for the next release. We did like you saw in the graphics, and this nest uh, called Guido. We, we it was active. Um, Mario got a new a new mate, and they were able to. Uh, if I remember, they got two or three chicks. Three, three chicks. Yeah, it was three chicks. Um, so we were really happy. It was the first the the there the, the were first chicks produced in the wild. Uh, the difference we did with the last uh, release that uh, we, we released the parrots uh, in the perimeter of the aviary and we installed the nest in the perimeter of the aviary. That way we have better monitoring of the population. And they've been doing it on Rio Abajo population and it's working pretty good. And we have adopted that uh, management for, for the wild population. And that's Mario. And first, first, uh, First chicks after the hurricane. Let's see the video. So yeah, we were really happy when we saw that. Um, uh, that was like a good news uh, for us. We went we on that time we received a lot of bad news, but that was a that was the wonderful news and it motivates us to continue with the program. Very much. Yeah. We were very happy, very happy biologists running around the forest. So thank you, Victor. 
Uh, our last thing to share with you is how can anyone help? Um, so things that we know can help the parents is that you can plant trees and, and really think about the need to cut a tree when you are cutting trees down. Sometimes you have to, but do you really need to cut that tree? When you buy a pet, know where your pet comes from. Um, you may not have been going out into the forest to collect a baby bird, but maybe the people who brought the birds to the pet store, maybe did they raise it in captivity or did they go to a forest and collect them? And after a big storm, a hurricane, or depending where you live in the world, maybe a wildfire, maybe a drought, you can put out bird food and water to help the animals in your area have food and water to make it through that initial time before food can grow again in the wild. And this applies to all birds. It, does, it helps more than parrots. It helps all species of birds. And with that, are there any questions? Jessica and Victor. Uh, we had a couple of questions in the comments. It looks like you guys have already answered those. Um, we talked about that the nests were made out of PVC, which was great. And then we also uh, had a question about who do you contact should you see a wild bird? That's great. Um, so if you are in Puerto Rico and you think you saw a Puerto Rican parrot, please contact El Jinky National Forest and we'll, we'll figure it out following up questions and figure out what you saw and if it really was a parrot, you can also contact our Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, and since you found this stream, you found our forest web pages, link to that so you know how to find us. All right, well, thank you uh, both so much. That was an excellent presentation and the amount of time and effort that has been put in to uh, save this bird from extinction has been tremendous. And so we wanna thank you guys for joining us today, joining our Mission Conservation live stream. Um, and uh, we wish the Puerto Rican parrot the best of luck in the future with you guys uh, watching after it. Well, thank you everyone for watching us today. Uh, we are happy to wrap up our endangered species uh, week or month this January and with a new month coming in February, just around the corner, Join us next week, next Tuesday at 1.30 p.m. Central Standard Time to talk presidents and conservation. So our new theme in February is the conservation presidents and uh, we will be speaking with the Boone and Crocker Club. So thank you guys and we'll see you next time. Thank you, bye-bye.